Good afternoon. Good morning. This is something to talk about a uh, three times a week program here at the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. And something to talk about is now being sponsored by the Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. Innovative and compassionate care worth the wait. Call 360-271-2530 and schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay today. Fieldstone Memory Care, Bainbridge Island. With us today is Dave Schutz, who has uh, had a illustrious career in the world of uh, broadcast um, licensing and uh, evaluating li licensing, which means he has a lot of knowledge about the way that uh, our federal government has, to greater or lesser extent, uh, regulated the uh, common broadcast airwaves. And as a result of that, he has a wonderful story uh, to share with us today about sort of the origins of the FCC. Dave, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you everyone for joining me electronically. Uh, this is sort of the first time that I've done a formal presentation specifically involving uh, Doc Brinkley. So please bear with me as uh, I sort of recount a story, a story that's near and dear to me Broadcasting, initially radio and later television, have always been the epicenter of my life. I built my first radio transmitter uh, when I was eight years old, about the time I built my first radio receiver. Throughout my life, I knew I wanted to work in the broadcasting industry and good circumstance, I was able to do that, securing my first job back in 1967 when I was 17 years old, playing the hits in a small community of Westerly, Rhode Island, about the same size as Milford, Kansas, a small community in the Kansas heartland we're gonna talk a lot about in the next 45 to 50 minutes. And uh, in terms of my academic background, I have a Bachelor of Science in Radio TV. Remember, Bachelor of Science is BS. By the end of this presentation, you get to determine whether or not this is BS <laughs> quality. I have a Master's in Finance, uh, and I am a uh, doctoral candidate, of course, all but dissertation, as many of us, as a Taggart Fellow in Marketing from New York University uh, Stern School of Business. But I love this industry, and I think sometimes to appreciate where we are in our very complex electronic media environment today, we need an understanding of where we've come from. And you know what, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. And indeed, so lies the story with one Dr. John Romulus Brinkley. Doc Brinkley, as we call him, uh, ultimately uh, gave the world a wonderful treatment for impotency in the early part of the 20th century, long before Viagra. And in fact, amongst his many contributions, Doc Brinkley helped bring about the Federal Communications Commission. So let's get started. The real birth of radio broadcasting, as distinct from radio uh, transmissions for telegraph or point-to-point -point communications, really go on back uh, to the beginning, 1902. Now, radio telegraph had come into existence in the closing years of the 19th century, but it wasn't until 1902 that engineers realized that you could actually transmit intelligence and in, intelligent information, specifically the human voice in places of dots and dash using a radio. So that's a very important date for us, 1906. There was a recognition by national governments that radio waves did not respect international borders. They didn't uh, respect state borders. Very rapidly in the United States, we began to realize 
that any kind of regulation or control of radio broadcasting within the United States would be a uniquely federal process because radio waves don't stop at the state line. Uh, 1920, we move forward and we see the first true radio broadcast. And I put the term broadcast in quotation marks because broadcasting is very different than simply sending radio waves out or two-way radio with voice like uh, amateur radio, etc. What's the definition of broadcasting? It's first, the transmission of a radio and later television signal. Secondly, its signal must be freely available to all, meaning you don't have to pay a subscription fee to receive the broadcast. Next, broadcasting cannot be used for point-to-point -point communications. I can't use a radio transmission in the broadcast band to say, please pick up a quart of milk for me. Okay. Who owns the broadcast radio and TV spectrum? The U.S. government. Well, that initially might seem a little bit counterintuitive because broadcasters, many of them are for-profit corporations. And actually the way the system works here in the United States and in probably a majority numerically of countries in the world is that individuals and or corporations, be they uh, profit driven or non-profit driven, are licensed by the government to offer, operate a broadcast station as a public trustee. In other words, you could think of it as equivalent almost like a type of franchise. Initially, when the broadcast radio and later television spectrum was being apportioned, the government gave away the licenses essentially for free. You might have the legal cost to prepare the paperwork, but you got the license for free. Later, you can resell those licenses subject to tacit approval from the FCC for basic qualifications of the buyer, and you can sell those licenses for whatever the market will bear. And that market can be a lot of money for the license, uh, our record being about $750 million for the license only of a broadcast TV station in New York. Okay, broadcast licensees as public trustees basically utilizing a public asset, which is considered the airways, have three things they must do. They must operate their FCC license stations in the public interest, for the public convenience, and as a public necessity. I may add parenthetically that not all radio spectrum that is controlled by the federal government is administered in terms of this concept of a license and the licensee being a trustee. Frequencies used most familiarly for cell phone operation are actually sold on a one-time basis through a public auction for billions, that's with a, with a B as in Bravo, to the public. And that's sold as you would be a piece of real estate with essentially no recourse for the government. Broadcasting is different. Broadcasting, you are a trustee with a licensee period. Okay, since the 1920s, the FCC and something called the Federal Radio Commission, which we'll talk about in, in a bit, actually have revoked the licenses for stations which they believed were violating the public interest, convenience, and necessity. So the government has been willing to intervene. And uh, if it finds a broadcaster that it doesn't think is operating properly, it will rescind their license, as we'll see. Uh, 
In the 1920s, the medium of radio broadcasting exploded. It was the wonderful new medium. Uh, very rapidly, the federal government entered. Uh, it, it had a dilemma which was unique to the frequencies used for AM broadcasting. Now, this is inherent in the nature of the frequencies, next slide please, used for AM broadcasting versus the frequencies used for FM or television. During the daylight hours, the frequencies propagate from the transmitter much as you would expect, sort of on a line of sight basis, with for AM broadcasting, the range of those line of sight signals being about 125 miles. However, after dark, things get interesting. The ionosphere, the upper layers of the atmosphere, about 100 miles above our head, begin to change when they are no longer polarized by ultraviolet light from the sun. Specifically, they begin to reflect the frequencies used for AM broadcasting. In effect, those signals bounce off the ionosphere and come back to Earth hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles from their point of origin. All right, let's move on to chapter two. Dr. Brinkley, who was he? What did he do? Well, Dr. Brinkley was born in North Carolina in 1885. He had a fascination for technology and rapidly earned his full credentials as a Western Union telegraph operator. And he did quite well with that. He married his first wife and uh, was a telegrapher. They moved around to various Western Union offices, increasing in size. But one John Romulus Brinkley had a love for technology. And around 1900 to 1910, medicine was evolving. And specifically, a great deal of attention in medicine was being focused on what I will call endocrinolog endocrinological systems, the endocrine system. We were beginning to learn the role of hormones and Doc Brinkley became fascinated with that. Doc Brinkley got so fascinated with it, he decided he would enroll in medical school. Of course, he didn't have an undergraduate degree because he'd been busy as a telegrapher but he found a medical school that would take him in. Minor point, said medical school was not accredited with any medical institution, but if you paid your money, you could start your classes. And Doc Brinkley went on for two years in that medical school until despite the fact that he was attending school and continuing to work two shifts a day for Western Union, the finances of a growing family created problems. Now, what's a good doctor uh, going to do in that situation? Well, he started thinking, why don't I go from a city to a small town where I can begin to use my medical knowledge, although incomplete because I've dropped out of medical school where might I go? And where I might go would be Milford, Kansas. Of course, you're all familiar with it. Milford, a little town of 12,000 people at best when Brinkley arrives about 1917, having done a two month, that's month, stint in the US military at the end of World War I. Uh, Doc Brinkley never saw action. He was found, found himself so nervous that he spent most of the time in an army hospital dealing with his nerves condition, but coming out with a clean general discharge, uh, I should say an honorable discharge, he moved his family to Milford where opportunity was ripe. And Doc Brinkley decided to open up the Brinkley Hospital, a true second floor operation from the start. 
And if you look up, you can look onto Doc Brinkley's price list, and we've got a close-up of that. Next slide. Yeah, enlarged and diseased prostates, that endocrine system, we'll give them here for $100. Now let's put that in perspective. This is 1918, next slide please. Uh, 1917, 2021, our $100 would be about $2,100 today. So, you know, for a walk-in second floor operation, Doc Brinkley knew people had money to spend. Well, Dr. Brinkley went to work, and Dr. Brinkley, through circumstances which still remain a bit uncertain, became convinced there was a magic elixir. In fact, he found that many of his patients, who were middle-aged people, were coming to him, they were men initially, complaining of issues of infertility and impotence. Doc Brinkley came up with an idea. Why not do transplants? Specifically, why not take the testicles from young, virile male goats, use, and of course, transplant them into the scrotums <laughs> of his patients? Seems perfectly logical to me. Seemed logical to Doc Brinkley, and Doc Brinkley went to work. And as you can see, there was, this is a uh, newspaper clipping, you can see the success as the first child is born. I, I'm not sure where the horns would be emerging and I don't see ex in the extreme right on the child any indication of a hoof. But uh, again, who can argue uh, with success? And Doc Brinkley started getting notoriety because Doc Brinkley, of course, realized that there was a combination between religion and selling uh, cures for impotency, and you can see a newspaper story. Well, Dr. Brinkley was the perpetual promoter. Next slide, please. Dr. Brinkley realized there was a new medium. Dr. Brinkley decides to set up a radio station in Milford. And his first station is KFKB. And he used it to promote his uh, goat glands. But Doc Brinkley had a problem in the 1920s. You see, there were already three other radio stations uh, that existed in, uh, uh, in Milford. And uh, Doc Brinkley's clinic did very well. As you can see, this is actually a San Bernardino, California paper. Uh, Doc Brinkley's hospital brought steady wages, employment, visitors, patients coming through who spent money in the restaurants. He revitalized Milford as uh, born out and even picked up on this wire service story out of San Bernardino. He brought success, helped pave the streets, brought electricity to Milford. And his first radio station, KFKB, uh, there he is, there are the uh, studios, that's one of the two transmitting towers uh, behind it, and that is the Brinkley Clinic, which had expanded. Uh, he was up to uh, 18 beds at that point, and he was using it to promote. But Doc Brinkley had a problem. You see, back in the early days of radio, there were problems getting programming. There were three national networks, NBC, Columbia, and Mutual. NBC sort of had two versions of its radio network known as NBC Red and Blue, but essentially there were three. Doc Brinkley's station was the fourth station in town. And that meant that back then you couldn't play recorded music. Why you couldn't play it? You couldn't play it because of copyright problems. There was no mechanism for broad license, copyright licensing of recorded music to individual radio stations. You could play a copyrighted phonographic record, but you had to go through the tedium of discovering through the Library of Congress uh, who the copyright holder was 
and going out and negotiating with them. There was no standard fee for how much they'd be paid to pay that. The net result was that radio stations either had their own small musical uh, groups or they had to rely on network programming for the majority of time. Well, as we saw before, there were only three uh, national networks. So Doc Brinkley decided that he would talk about the life and world. And this is a picture of Doc Brinkley, actually from the early 1930s, uh, doing one of his multi-hour talks. He would talk about medicine. Of course, he'd talk about his uh, goat gland transplant and he would lease time to other, uh, well, we might say somewhat nefarious business people who would come forth and wanted to use the new medium of broadcasting. And remember at night, the broadcast signals of his little Milford station might go hundreds of miles further. Dr. Brinkley also made a lasting contribution to radio broadcasting. You see, NBC Mutual broadcasting was envisioned as being something that would convey prestigious programming. You would have the NBC Symphony Orchestra, the Texaco broadcast of the New York Metropolitan Opera. But everything was prestigious. Brinkley needed cheap programming and after time, people got tired of listening just to talk radio. So he discovered there were these local musicians, this, this strange local music that defied many of the ideas of what symphonic music traditionally was. He discovered country music and played it on the radio. In fact, one of his biggest stars were the Carter family, which basically he promoted and which developed in their own right. And you can honestly say that Amongst the children that Doc Brinkley's medical procedures are supposedly fathered, you can say that Doc Brinkley himself fathered the genre of country music on radio. So he, he accomplished amazing things. And you know, Dr. Brinkley also went into print. Uh, you can find this on eBay occasionally. Uh, this is Flower's book talking about Doc Brinkley. Flower has no, uh, no research credentials of his own. He was paid by uh, Brinkley to write the book, but it was an attempt to provide some authenticity, some credibility uh, to Doc Brinkley's primary claim. And uh, Doc Brinkley's notoriety in the state of Kansas was so good, he ran for governor, not just once in 1928, he ran a second time in 1932, and he came remarkably close to winning the gubernatorial race, but uh, alas, he did not. All right, let's talk about 1927. A lot took place in radio in 1927. See, before 1927, next slide please, if you wanted to run a radio station, it, uh, in terms of registering it or getting uh, permission or notification really, telling the government that I'm gonna broadcast, you file what was essentially a postcard notice with the Department of Commerce. And the Department of Commerce would come out with monthly lists basically talking about the new uh, stations uh, that had been put on the air, the attempt was to try and provide some semblance or organization to this AM broadcasting ban running from 550 to 1600 uh, kilohertz on the dial, but it was notification. 1927, an important event took place, and that was the fact that the countries of the world got together for a second time, operating under what was known as the World uh, uh, at Radio uh, Convention. And they came together to again apportion the band and begin to decide what specific frequencies would be used for broadcasting and attempt to minimize interference of broadcast stations
uh, upon each other. Additionally, Congress went and created the Federal Radio Commission. Well, the, F the FRC came into existence primarily as an administrative tool, a way to avoid uh, essentially damaging interference between stations. What the Federal Radio Commission in general could not do was really police programming. Well, around 1930, Doc Brinkley began to have a problem, and that's borne out on this front page of the St. Louis Star. You see, Doc Brinkley had proclaimed himself a doctor with a medical credential, an MD degree, but he was one of the uh, doctors who had basically bought their medical degree uh, simply through this facility, uh, this bogus medical school. Well, while the Federal Radio Commission didn't have control really over programming, uh, they got on Doc Brinkley's back and he was starting to get into serious trouble. Meanwhile, in 1934, we're jumping forward a couple of years, Congress was getting additional complaints regarding abuses, everything from Ponzi schemes on the radio to uh, bogus fortune telling, etc. Plus, unrelated to radio, we were seeing the rapid spread of telephone through the country. Well, telephone had existed since the late uh, 19th century in major cities, but the problem confronting uh, rural America in the early 1930s was getting basic telephone service out to rural agricultural communities, much the same way the motivation for the Bonneville Power Authority came about was the idea for Bonneville was rural electrification. The idea uh, for Congress was to spread telephone, universal telephone service to rural areas. So they created a new agency, the Federal Communications Commission. And basically, it differed from the Federal Radio Commission, which it replaced in that for broadcasters, it began to control content. And it, you know, a second unrelated activity was advancing rural telephone use. All right, what were some of the key initial broadcast programming rules that the FCC applied? Well, they were the fairness doctrine and personal attacks come down to the heart of the matter. You could take a position as a broadcaster or carry programming of a controversial nature. However, you had to make an equal quantity of time available to individuals who held an opposing opinion. Additionally, if you attack the credibility of an individual, you had an obligation to notify that person, typically by registered mail, that they had been attacked and provide them with an opportunity to respond. Second, the licensee had a responsibility for the accuracy and truthfulness of the content. If you were advertising a product, it had to be a bona fide product. If you were offering some type of medicinal medicine, there had to be a reasonable body of proof that it worked the way it was claimed. Likewise, I'm sorry, Sean Hannity, you wouldn't have had a place in 1940 on a broadcast over the air signal. Rachel Maddow, you might have had something similar. We're not going to show any favorites. Additionally, there are provisions which remain to this day prohibiting lotteries, fortune telling, and obscene content. And what I mean by lotteries is initially the statute as written into the regulatory base 
was a prohibition on all lottery information. Obviously, state lotteries did not exist at that point in time. It was later modified to include information about state lotteries. The major concern of the legislation were lotteries that were being run for the financial benefit of a private individual without any form of oversight and more importantly, any control of fairness, the odds uh, for the people participating. Well, uh, the creation of the uh, FCC and specifically the, uh, uh, the revelation that uh, uh, Dr. Brinkley's uh, medical credentials were essentially bogus, brought about the end of radio station KFKB. Ever wonder what the call letters stand for? Uh, well, it's uh, uh, Kansas folks know best, KFKB. Let's move on, chapter five. The birth of the border blaster station. What do I mean by a border blaster? Well, we talked about how there was a recognition that radio signals don't respect, nor do they heed, uh, political boundaries, be they local, state, or international. And indeed, uh, we talked about the uh, next slide. Uh, we talked about 1927 being a significant year for an international conference that was held, the World Administrative Radio Conference. But that same year after the conclusion of the WARC meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, the Canadian and the Americans got together and had what they, they did invite the Mexicans, they call, had what they called the North American Radio Conference. And they looked at the AM broadcast dial between 550 and 1600. And they said, you know, we really need some frequencies that because of these nighttime sky waves, signals and frequencies that will be reserved for exclusive use of stations in Canada and the United States. This led to what we call a clear channel station. At the time, this would mean that a high powered station operating on its frequency either in Canada or the United States might very well be the only station in North America broadcasting on that frequency. Well, as far as the Canadians in the United States were concerned, the, their definition of North America did not include the country of Mexico. More specifically, while the US and Canada basically sliced up the AM broadcast band, reserving frequencies for stations in their respective countries, Mexico was left out. Oh, by the way, the rationale for that was that the population of Mexico is heavily clustered in the southern portion of the country, this is 1930, and spe uh, specifically in and around the country's capital of Mexico City, about 500 miles south of the international border. This created an opportunity. The Mexican government was, to say the least, angry in the aftermath of the North American radio conference. And uh, they had no problem. In fact, they considered it almost a chance to get even with the Yankees, that uh, when they were approached about the idea of building radio stations just over the Texas-Mexican line, and with those stations beaming their signals northward, Additionally, broadcasting in English language within the geographic confines of a Spanish-speaking country. They were all for it. Who's to say whether or not influence was peddled with the uh, governing bodies in Mexico? But the Mexicans basically thumbed their nose. Oh, by the way, 
whereas the Canadians and the Americans had agreed to an absolute power limitation, maximum power for their AM broadcast stations of 50,000 watts. The Mexicans' attitude with the border blasters were, the sky's the limit, do what technology wants. You want 500,000 watts of power, 10 times what anybody in Canada and the US is doing, go for it. And believe me, that wasn't an easy accomplishment back then. Uh, this happens to be uh, one of the stations, this is the station, the first border blaster, uh, which Doc Brinkley brought about. Uh, XERA, just over the border from Del Rio, Texas, about 140 miles west of San Antonio, Texas. See, the technology didn't yet exist for building super powerful transmitters, and Doc Brinkley basically underwrote the research and development to build amplifying tubes uh, sufficient to create a 500,000 watt signal. This is one of the water-cooled tubes that he used, capable of 100,000 watt plate dissipation. Now that in operation would be surrounded by a distilled water, uh, well, by distilled water in the central portion of the tube to dissipate uh, the waste heat that was generated. Well, as I said, KXREA, unfortunately, when my research, I cannot find a signal coverage map as to exactly what was covered with XERA's signal. But we have a hint. Between 1934 and 1939, station WLW in Cincinnati, Ohio, was granted experimental permission from the FCC to operate at 500,000 watts, the power level of XERA down the border blaster. In fact, for orientation, you can see the handwritten note. The upper right-hand corner of that would be Del Rio, Texas, essentially the location. And you can see how immense the signal contour is at night. That outer one millivolt per meter signal intensity would be a good solid signal after dark from WLW. Now take the epicenter of that and move it south and orient it to go north. In the case of WLW, they were trying to protect uh, Toronto, which is why you can see the tuck in the signal area toward Toronto relative to Cincinnati. Flip that 180 degrees around, make it directional, and at night, you listen to Doc Brinkley, not only in the United States, but throughout the populated areas of Canada. Amazing story. Well, as you might think, operating a radio station where there were a few bounds on programming was an extremely financially rewarding endeavor for Doc Brinkley. In fact, Doc Brinkley, having been forced out of operating a physical medical clinic in any state in the United States, uh, moved his clinic down just over the border uh, from Del Rio uh, into Mexico. Uh, but uh, Doc Brinkley liked to live the good life. And this is a recent photo of the Dr. Brinkley mansion, one of several. This is his Del Rio home. Having been born and initially raised in North Carolina, he still had a North Carolina retreat as well, particularly for those warm summers in Southern Texas. And uh, in many respects, Doc Brinkley is still considered uh, uh, a hero, if you would. Uh, his home in Del Rio has been designated a Texas State historical location, and this is the commemorative sign you would find today outside of the building. Not all stories end happily. Besieged with uh, patients who had suffered medical abuse, uh, who had suffered infections from his goat gland transplant, uh, Dr. Brinkley was sued. In fact, Dr. Brinkley was brought up on mail fraud charges uh, in 1940 uh, by the federal government. These were the first federal uh, 
criminal charges, uh, Doc Brinkley had been suffering the effects of congestive heart failure, but he died rather suddenly in 1942 of heart failure. When he died, he was penni penniless and besieged by additional civil lawsuits, the pending federal criminal charges for mail fraud and creditors everywhere. And so that is the story of Dr. Romulus Brinkley. There's a wonderful documentary uh, that came out about five years ago, 2016, uh, done by Penny Lane. No, that's not just the Beatles song. Uh, that's also the name of the producer of this. Uh, it's won a couple of awards. Uh, we've got a little bit of time here. And so if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna play the trailer for, uh, do you have audio on this? You're hearing that? It'll come up. Cure your impotence. You want me to implant goat testicles into you. Well, Doc, that can't be worse than a nuts I got. Well. Oops. Sorry. First, they came bringing their own goats. Pretty soon, he had his own herd of goats out back. The patient would select a goat with which he felt the most connection. And then they would come in and do this sort of double operation. My wife just gave birth to our first child. I am living proof that the goat glands in my scrotus are working. I'd show all of you right now if the ladies were present. Dr. Dr. Are they shutting you down? Is your form of medicine found in any textbook? I highly doubt it. Did you learn it in school? Of course not. Then how do you know it works? He had a sort of weird sex appeal. He was kind of like the Dr. Ruth Westheimer of the 20s and 30s. He was already grooming himself for the next move. The harder they hit me, the higher I bounce. XCRA was the world's most powerful broadcasting station. He had a million ideas and had a huge influence on uh, the course of popular culture. He saw the future. And uh, I'd like to just make a couple of additional uh, comments regarding Doc Brinkley. An interesting aspect during his civil trial, there was one courageous uh, journalist who decided to essentially, in 1930, say the emperor has no clothes, or specifically Doc Brinkley is a fraud. Doc Brinkley, of course, to maintain his business, undertook a defamation suit uh, against that journalist and the uh, court proceeding was rather fascinating. Uh, in part, uh, to their defense, the journalist was able to get f several f former nurses from Doc Brinkley's surgical facilities where he was doing the transplantation to testify under oath that uh, many, many times Doc Brinkley actually never transplanted any testicles into the patient. Quite rather, he would do a dissection uh, incision and then promptly sew it up. The power of placebo, the power of belief was sufficient to create a, uh, shall we say, a, uh, a rise in the spirits, if not the anatomy of many of his patients. Uh, the second thing that was sort of fascinating is that many of the nurses proclaimed that on a typical surgical day, Doc Brinkley was roaringly drunk. Uh, and in fact, they weren't at all surprised when he did not do any physical transplantation uh, simply because they weren't sure whether or not he'd even be able to close the wound and many times had to rely upon his uh, surgical assistance to do the same. But you see, it's the power of placebo. And even with those accusations present, he almost became the governor of Kansas in 1932. So I guess you can use the platform of broadcasting 
whether it's over a little station in Milford, the NBC television network, or motion pictures to launch a political career, and maybe you can go on to be president.